Take your Bible, if you would, because I ain't going to teach out anything else. Amen. Amen. And um, let's go to Deuteronomy 18. I know I was there in Sunday school, and um, but being it's, you don't get a, October 31st on a Sunday very often. So I thought, well, let's, let's make good use of it here. Um, this is a teaching, like I said before, uh, I've done years and years ago. And um, it's, it's helped me a lot. And um, I've made mention of here lately um, that we live in a different world than what my parents grew up in, what their parents grew up in, and so on. There was the rationality of America uh, post-World War II. Um, you had the baby boomers, you had all the guys coming back from the war start new families, kids going into school, and with the onset of things like radio, television, um, and so on, well, it helped shape people's opinions. Um, one of the things that I studied, and I, I've, never really, I've never really been comfortable with exactly why this particular year, let me give you the year, 1963. Now, that was three years before I was born, so no, I don't remember 1963. But it, it was definitely a year of turmoil all over the world. Um, you had, in 1963, the Supreme Court, um, the Warren Court, Earl Warren was the Supreme Court Justice at the time, and this basically was, had been coming on for years. Um, it just seemed like a different spirit entering into our country and our society um, when the Supreme Court ruled that public prayers could no longer be said in public school classrooms that that was a violation of the separation of church and state, which none, none, of either of the founding fathers nor later presidents and congressmen and uh, judicial court members ever believed in. They never believed that. Um, but there was, there was a clear separation made, 1963, by removing what amounted to Christian prayers out of every public school, and things began to change that year. Now, it, I don't think it was just the Supreme Court decision in 1963 that caused that. You had the public execution of an American president in ritualistic fashion, and I can show you the ritualism. You also had according to uh, former Jesuit priest Malachi Martin, a ritual held in the Vatican along with a church in Charlotte, South Carolina. Charlotte was chosen, I think, for its location, uh, 33rd degree north. Um, and, it was called, and it was in conjunction with a ceremony held in St. Paul's Cathedral, which is where they choose a pope, um, called the enthronement ceremony of the fallen angel Lucifer. And um, this was a real event. And uh, Martin wrote about it in a book called Windswept House that he wrote. I have a copy of that book. And if you read that ceremony, it would just it'd blow your mind. And so a lot of things of a spiritual nature took place in 1963. Let's just say it that way, but not of a good spirit. Whereas before 63, 
there was a co- what, what I would refer to as a common decency. Yes, there were sodomites back then, but they would not dare show themselves. Not in any area, not, not, especially not in the armed forces. They wouldn't even reveal themselves in Hollywood. It was known, but they would not reveal themselves in Hollywood. And, and I um, watched a video the other day of about 25 of these old movie stars from like the 40s and 50s that were gay, and it'll blow your mind. And it, it, wasn't, just, um, it wasn't just Rock Hudson either. That blew everybody's mind. That blew everybody. When Rock Hudson had to come out, because he was dying of AIDS, and we had to come out and say, there's a reason why, and told the reason, it, it just knocked everybody off their feet. They were not expecting that. And you had other movie actors, TV actors, things like that. And it, you look back at the history of Hollywood, it's a common thing. Uh, but then television started changing. Music started changing after 63. In television, you, you had TV shows taking on occult themes. Before 63, it wasn't happening. Before 63, it was primarily dramas, artistic dramas, artistic ones. Not these soapy ones. But artistic dramas, Alfred Hitchcock and st- things like that. Um, and you had uh, a lot of detective shows, early crime shows, things like that. After 63, you had the Adams Family, you have the Munsters, you have Bewitched. And you have just, uh, it's just, television's changed, just like that. Uh, then you look at old Dragnet series, 1968, 1969, and Jack Webb doing his typical diatribe that he does in most of the shows. And he's talking about the evils that are going on among youth in Los Angeles. And he mentions homosexuality as being one of them. Well, then you just like five years later, you have all in the family. And they're like pushing homosexuality as being a legitimate lifestyle, making people feel bad for thinking that's wrong. And it was, it was the stated objective. Uh, who's the guy that wrote All in the Family? Who's the guy that produced it? I can't remember his name. But he, he said, I'm making it a point to change the whole country. I'm going to change the whole country. Huh? No, Carl Reiner was on the show but the, I'm talking the producer, the director of the show, the guy who, who started it, created it. But he basically said, I've just made up my mind. I'm going to use this show to change American thought. And he, and he did. It worked. And uh, so then you just, you're just going downhill from there on everything. But you have, a, you have a time in the innocence, I guess, of the 40s and 50s and early 60s where... If you said, do you believe in witches? Everybody would say, no, I don't believe in witches. You believe in ghosts? No, I don't believe in ghosts. Those are not real. Those are fake. Those are just fairy tale stories, myths, things like that. Witches aren't real. Ghosts aren't real. People don't come back from the dead and all of this stuff. Okay? But the Bible's been true all along. Witches have been real. There are ghosts. There are spirits. And these things are, have been everywhere. They were around back then and they're around now. The fact that they can hide behind public opinion that says there are no such things only aids them. It helps them. Because if people start believing, yes, there are ghosts, there are spirits, uh, there are witches, then people would say, you know what, if there are, I don't want that around me. I don't want that in my house. I don't, you know, I'm not going to have a coffin with a dead man coming out of it in my living room for Halloween. That was me. Okay? I was the guy coming out of the coffin. So anyway, uh, no kidding. No kidding. And I won't, I won't say anything about where I got it from. But some people down in Richwoods where I used to pastor, they had heard that I, could, that I possibly might be able to get a hold of a real coffin. And so they called me. And I said, hang on a second, I'll find out. So I called somebody that I just happened to know. And he said, yeah, I've got one. He said, the only thing is, I don't want it back. 
I said, this will tickle them to death. Because it was a family down there that they did it big. And so having a real genuine coffin that had actually been used in a funeral service just tickled them to death. Because that put that in their living room. So anyway. Uh, let's start out with this and we'll go to prayer. Jeremiah 10, 2, thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. If the world's doing it, it may not necessarily be wrong. Okay? But if the world's doing it, you might ought to think about it. And be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. That means anything that takes place in the sky, like solar eclipses, lunar eclipses, you know, stars lining up, things like that, it blows their mind because the gods are at work. And God's telling us, don't fall for that. Because who designed the heavens? Who designed the motions of every star and every planet and of the sun, the moon? Who designed those motions? God did. And I had the hardest time getting that through to some people. Every time I teach about the beauty of the equinoxes and the winter solstice, summer solstice, because they are, there's a beautiful picture there about Christ, the cross, and about the gospel. Everybody thinks I'm teaching astrology, and I'm not. Satan didn't make the stars, and he didn't make them move the way they did. God did. And the heavens tell the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Okay? So anyway, learn not the way of the heathen. Be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. Father, open our eyes tonight. Bless your word. And Father, we just pray for people. Lord, I've learned not to judge. Uh, if people would have judged me years ago, I probably wouldn't, according to them, I would have never made it to heaven. So, Father, I pray, dear God, that we would just use this tonight uh, as a way to draw attention to what your word says versus what the world says. So open our eyes and teach us great and mighty things tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Um, let me see, I have a verse in my mind, and I uh, don't really feel good enough to, to quite remember where exactly it is, but yeah, here it is, I found it. First Timothy 4, turn there. This Bible really is real, and it does describe the world around us that we cannot see. Everything that goes on happens as a result of the moving of a spirit of some kind. Um, the word genius, the word genius was applied to, it, it derives from literally the word genie. Genie, like in Aladdin's lamp. Because it was believed that great ideas, new ideas, new discoveries in science, the arts, astronomy, things like that, uh, were made as a result of a spirit guiding someone's thoughts and teaching them those things. So when you use the word genius, it literally referred to a spirit that taught them mathematics, or it taught them. Uh, what was the guy's name? He was a, he was a black guy, musician. Um, they made the movie about him, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? He goes to the crosswords. He, he doesn't know how to play the, pian the guitar. He's real bad at it, stinks at it, but wants to become the greatest guitar player in the world. He goes to this crossroad, has a meeting with a spirit, and he says, I'll sell my soul if you teach me how to play guitar. Six months later, he shows up at these same saloons and nightclubs that he had been playing in where they boot him out the door, and now he's doing things that nobody can do on a guitar. I mean, huh? 
No. No, it's, it's, I can't remember his name. But it, there, he was, his, his character was featured in the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And it's a true story. Because literally, the guy cannot play. And then afterwards, it's like he grew two fingers on each hand. Because he is literally playing things that people are watching him. They're going, how did that sound come out of that guitar? And you can, a lot of rock and roll artists have been interviewed over the years. And they say, when I step on stage, boom, something takes over me. And I can sing notes that I've never sung before. Uh, who is it that has a, an alternate named Sasha Fierce? Beyonce. She has an alternate that when she goes on stage, this spirit ca ca called, that she calls Sasha Fierce comes out and displays itself in her, in her act, making her, allowing her to sing the things she does, to dance the way she does, to entertain the way she does. And um, there's no doubt in my mind. Uh, they interviewed one of the guys from The Who, and a uh, British guy, and he said, uh, we walk out on stage, he said, something takes over, and he said, it's a very, it's a very powerful spirit, and he said, uh, if you came and tried to mess with me while that spirit in there, he said, I'd probably kill you right there on stage, I'd probably just tear your head off right there, and he said, I probably would, and um, so anyway, there's no doubt in my mind, the spiritual influence that goes on behind the scenes, First Timothy chapter 4 tells us that. And Ephesians 2 does as well, but let's read 1 Timothy 4. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. What does the Spirit do? Make you laugh? Make you roll around? Bark like a dog? Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, duh, giving heed to what? Seducing spirits. And I believe that's literal. Literally seducing spirits and doctrines of devils speaking lies in hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron there's your iron kingdom right there that's what's going to happen with everybody once the iron kingdom sets in people are going to have their conscience seared with a hot iron they're going to do that which is unseemly and they're not going to think anything of it whatsoever they'll kill people and have no guilt or remorse about it whatsoever. Uh, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats and so on. T now turn to um, Ephesians 2. Verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world. You were in the same lane that everybody else was in, and that lane leads to destruction, leads to hell. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So do we believe that spirits are helping people write lyrics to songs? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do we even believe that they're helping them write the tunes to songs? Because I'm telling you, there is, a there is a huge difference between a number one selling song and one that barely makes the charts. It has everything to do with the key changes, the progression, the, the lyric, the melody. It grabs you in a way that nothing ever does, and when you compare that to something that was written that never made it to the charts, there's a difference. There is a big difference. Uh, I'll just give you a, a silly example, but uh, this one works. The first Aladdin cartoon was scored by a professional. And the score itself won all these prizes. The score itself was amazing. The musical score for the cartoon was amazing. Robin Williams' character was absolutely astounding. They put him in a room with a box of toys and let him go for hours on end. They recorded him and had to narrow hours of tape down to an hour and a half cartoon, which was nearly impossible. Robin Williams didn't sign on for the second, for the... 
uh, for the sequel to that. Neither did the guy who wrote the original score. The music stinks. The music is terrible in the second Aladdin movie. And the acting of the genie is nothing like Robin Williams. Makes a difference. Okay, it makes a difference. And so I guarantee you the number one songs, the number one movies, the number one TV shows, the number one whatever, there are spirits there that are writing and doing things that know they can get to the soul of a man. They know it. Satan was built with musical instruments into his body and he knew how to use them. Okay? He knew how to use them. So there's just an example there of, of what these spirits... This is why God, over in Deuteronomy 18, this is why God said what he said. Now, some people say, well, God just didn't want people finding out the truth about these, uh, about these religious practices, about how much power they would give mankind. No, God knew everything. And God knew the spirits that were behind him, and God knew what those spirits were eventually going to do to those people. It all starts out fun and games until someone gets their eye poked out. Okay? Or until someone gets their eye, both eyes in, and they go to hell. It all starts out good. Okay? But it leaves them empty at the end. Um... So anyway, God said, you're going to go into this land and you're going to see things you've never seen before. Don't pay attention to it. Don't learn it. Don't read their books. Don't do anything. Don't talk to their priest. Don't learn their religion. And I'm telling you this for a favor. I'm telling you, number one, that their religion doesn't work near as well as they say it does. Witchcraft, if anything, is hit and miss. Sometimes they cast spells and they work. Sometimes they don't. Why? God won't let it. God won't let it work. Uh, sometimes somebody can tell the future. And then sometimes they'll get it wrong. Why? That's God's way of saying, you got the wrong religion. I wrote a book that can tell you your entire future, it'll never be wrong one time. Amen. And those of us who have turned to this said, you know what, he's right. It's never been wrong one time. So he says in verse 9 of Deuteronomy 18, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. Gloria Leonard honestly thought that that was somebody who kisses you on the neck. A neck romancer. Didn't you, Gloria? <laughs> For all that do these things are an abomination <laughs> unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. This is why God got rid of them. By the way, this is why God is getting rid of the one third of the angels. That's why he's kicking them out. Because they're the spirits that are behind all this. Those who practice divination... Yes, they are reading things that there's a chance those things are going to happen. The spirits are telling them those, those things. Say this to them. And I believe those same spirits then will try to cause that very thing to happen to give that person with familiar spirits more power. It's all about raising them up. Now... Um, this morning I talked about the pass through the fire thing, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time with that. But God said, just don't do it. And to be so demoralized, which I can see this is where we're headed in this country. 
We're being desensitized to crime, fires, wars. We're being desensitized to everything. We see this on TV all the time. We see fires, we see first responders, we see cops, uh, we see people arrested, we see crime stories all the time, real crime stories all the time. We are being desensitized to crime, okay? Uh, there was a day when they would never show a dead body on TV, even a fake dead body on TV. They wouldn't show it. Now they show real dead bodies and think nothing of it. Uh, so a lot of desensitization is going on here. Uh, so let me get to, let me get to, keep going here, we're right here. Divination. What is divination? Well, it has the word divine in it, so it must be coming from God, correct? Well, for these nations which thou shalt possess, Deuteronomy 18, 14, God said, they hearkened unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. So let me tell you in a, um, well, let me, read, let me read this. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet, capital P, that was Christ, from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. So here's what God's saying. God's saying you can go to a diviner and they're going to be hit and miss. They won't always tell you everything. But you can co then come, you can call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. You can ask me through prayer and then I can open up my word and show you. And once I do that, boom, it's in you forever. You're going to believe it and you're going to see it happen. And it'll do it 100% of the time. God said, I will never be wrong ever. I'm the most high God, which means there's nothing I can't see, including all of human history, past, present, and future. I can see it all. I'm telling you what's going to happen. Trust me, this is going to happen. I can even tell you the exact words that Christ is going to say on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I can even tell you after that, in case you think Jesus read that and practiced it and did it on the cross himself, I can even tell you that while he's on the cross, they're going to part his garments and cast lots for his vesture. I can also show you in the same chapter, they're going to pierce his hands and feet too. And all of those things happened. They were written a thousand years before Christ went on the cross. That's, that's like throwing a dart from the earth and expecting to hit an exact point on the moon a month later just by throwing the dart. That's pretty good, isn't it? Which, by the way, that's what Neil Armstrong did, only he did it in three days. An exact spot on the moon. Boom. There he was. Um, anyway, so what is divination? It is, it is receiving knowledge by supernatural means from any source other than God or his word. So whether it's you receive it from a spirit itself or you receive it from someone who has a familiar spirit, you're receiving that knowledge from them, that's divination. And God said those people there were diviners and God said, this is why I'm kicking them out and I'm bringing you in. And I don't want you. Besides that, I'm going to give you a prophet who's going to be 100% right all the time. And he's never, ever, ever going to be wrong. Now, uh, I saw this at Walmart Friday. I took Lisa shopping for a little while. And this was a t-shirt at Walmart. Has anybody seen it? You don't have one, do you? Okay. Who recognized the characters? That's Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas. It's in that style. What does it mean, the lovers? Does anybody know? 
That's a tarot card. It's a tarot card, which I've edited part of it because they're naked. But you're wearing a tarot card. And the symbolic meaning of, what's that number? V-I, you don't know how to read Roman numerals? Six, what's in Genesis six? Sons of God, marrying the daughters of men. Okay? Daniel two, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. That's the meaning of this tarot card. That's what it means. Now, you won't find out on a lot of websites, but I'm telling you that's what it means according to Scripture. Okay? And uh, it's the joining. Notice there is a tree there with a snake in it by her. There is a tree behind Adam. What do you think that tree is? There was only two trees in the Garden of Eden. Tree of knowledge of good and evil. And this angel character, which probably represents Lucifer, with his hands blessing them and bringing them together. Pairing up the tree of life and the tree of death. Join them together. Okay? So tarot cards are a type of divination. A tarot card person can lay out cards and then tell you your fortune based upon the layout of those cards, what they mean, so on and so on. Now, here's the problem. Here's one problem. If you go to 50 different websites on what tarot cards mean, you're going to get 50 different interpretations. Okay? So which one do you believe? Which one do you hold to? Which one do you go along with? It's like having 50 different translations of the Bible. Which one eventually are you going to believe? Okay? Which one are you going to hold to? Divination is the attempt of ascertaining information by interpretation of omens or an alleged supernatural agency. Fortune tellers. Those who looked in crystal balls. That's called scrying. Gazing into a pond, gazing into a bowl of water, gazing into a bowl of mercury. They're all basically the same. You're looking into like a mirror and you're trying to see the spirits that are in there who will show you or scenes and visions. What did sleeping... Uh, um, who was it? The... That in Sleeping Beauty, who would go to the mirror on the mirror, mirror on the wall? Who's the fairest one of all? She was scrying. She was divining and trying to ascertain from this spirit that was in that mirror to tell her what to do. Okay? 1 Samuel 6, 2, the Philistines called for the priest and the diviner saying, What shall we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith we shall send it to his place. Since they couldn't call on God, because they're the Philistines, Philistines never talk to God. They don't want God. They called for their diviners and their priests. They wanted through, they wanted devils to tell them what to do with this Ark of the Covenant. Because they were trying to get rid of it. Because it was killing everybody. It was a curse to them. They didn't want it. So they asked after diviners. And asking for occult knowledge. Tell us what the gods are saying to tell us to do with the Ark of the Covenant. Deuteronomy 13. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods. Not another god, but other gods. This Bible is right. They're going to go after other gods. They're going to get a bunch of them. Which thou hast not known and let us serve them. Notice how this dreamer of dreams is just so easy with saying, here's these gods, let's serve these gods. Let's bow ourselves down to them and let's do what they tell us to do. 
which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And I can tell you that, and I told a lady this years ago, she, I said this to her about uh, watching out for her pastor, talking about other forms of prayer that he's going to teach them about. And she said, he's already doing that. I said, you better get out of that church. Because if your pastor is doing these forms of prayer, he is hearing from devils. He is allowing spirits to tell him and lead him in what to say and what to do. They're helping him write his sermons for crying out loud. They're inspiring him on ideas that may sound religious, but are not scriptural. And he will lead that congregation into being attached and then controlled by familiar spirits. Churches where people say we have gotten so spiritual with God, we no longer need the Bible anymore. Where are they getting their inspiration from? They say they're getting it directly from God. But God's not going to speak outside of this book. But they believe that he does. Oh, you people have got, you've confined God to a book. Well, Jesus did. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written to me to do thy will, O God. 1 Samuel 28, 8. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. And he went, and two men went with him. And they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee. There is no way that was Samuel. Not a chance. No way. No how. Okay? Jeremiah 14, 14. And God cursed Saul for that. For turning to a familiar spirit. And he died the next day. Fell on his own sword. Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. So where are they getting? Since, since they are rejecting the word of God, in churches all over the world, all over the country, they're rejecting the word of God. What then is the inspiration for their sermons? Can't be the Holy Spirit. So let's say I'm a, let's say I've got a church of about five, six hundred people. And uh, it's a stable church. And I'm going to keep it that way, and I'm too lazy to study myself. And I want to go out and play golf, and I want to play video games. So I call up some company and say, send me your sermon series for the next three months. So they send me a pre-packaged sermon series with all the handouts, all the banners that go with it, music to go with it, everything's prepackaged, the sermon outlines and the illustrations already written out. And I can tell you, I personally cannot study, get one of these prepackaged sermons and deliver unto you a 30, 40, 50 minute sermon, easy, just by reading somebody else's notes, coming up with the rest on my own. Easy to do. Who wrote that sermon? Nobody knows. But I guarantee you, they're not hiring godly men anymore to write them. They're, they're doing what Jim Baker admitted to in a book that he wrote when he got out of prison. He said when he was in charge of TBN, and, uh, well, not TBN, but the, um, the PTL club, he said he had a staff that helped him write his sermons. And he said, we didn't go through the scriptures looking for things to preach on. We came up with a list of things to preach on and how to get the most offerings out of people that we could 
Then we developed the outline and then went and found the scriptures that fit the outline. He said, that's how we did it. And he said, I know I'm going to make a lot of my former friends angry because I'm telling them, I'm telling everybody how we did it. But he said, that's how we did it. And that's exactly what's going on today. The prophets prophesy lies in my name. Um, I mentioned to you this morning, um, Gwen, what's her name? The way down lady, Gwen Chamblin. She arose to prominence back in the 90s. She was a registered dietitian, had a master's degree. She's smart. But she came up with a weight loss plan that included prayer. And she went around holding seminars. She wrote a book. It got picked up, sold millions of copies. Her program is being run in 20, 30,000 churches across the country. Of course, these churches have to pay a very premium price to her to get the rights to teach these courses in the churches. She's making DVDs, she's making products, she's making millions and millions and millions of dollars. And all of a sudden she comes out, she was Church of Christ, which is a problem already. And then she says she no longer believes in the Trinity, the Godhead. That gets, that gets her, she, Brentwood canceled her next book project. So she has to figure out what to do. She takes the money that she's got, uh, buys some property in the, one of the richest parts of Nashville, puts a big church up there. Now she's the pastor of this church called the, the Remnant Church because they're all the people that got kicked out of the Church of Christ over her. And all you have to do is spend a little while examining what she says to learn that she equated weight loss with salvation. And that if you didn't, if you ate more than eight bites at a meal, you're serving Satan and sinning in the eyes of God. So her, her gospel was a works gospel. If you were fat, you got fired from her, where she, the place that she had. She would fat shame people. She raised her children. She got in big trouble because there was a family in Georgia that took everything she said literally and ended up murdering their own son. Locked him up in his room for days. No food, nothing but a Bible. Beat him so bad that he died from his injuries. They're now spending 15, 20, 30 years in prison, and rightfully so. And she had to come out scrambling and lying through her teeth that she had nothing to do with it. But when you examine her teachings, they did what she said to the letter. The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. Jeremiah 29, 8, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. Do not trust dreams. Don't, not yours, not mine, not anybody else's on the internet. Reject those people. You don't even know whether they had the dream or not. I'll give you an example. Stan Johnson, the Prophecy Club, came out with a newsletter. And he said his daughter had a vision, a night vision, a dream. Stan uh, printed this in his newsletter and put it out as truth. That his daughter was shown, she was taken to hell and shown that there was two sections of hell. One was hell fire. The other one was like Antarctica, a frozen waste tundra full of ice and everything like that 
And she said that the angel told her that that's where all the cold churches and Christians go that have a semblance of Christianity, but they don't have the power of it. Published that in his little magazine, in his uh, newsletter that he sent out. And I went, he's nuts. She didn't no more get that from God than Francis the talking mule really talked. <laughs> this is what he's talking about. Don't fall for these people. You want to know what God said? Read the Bible. Amen. Micah 3.11, almost done. The heads thereof judge for reward. There they go. Why did they do it? The love of money. And the priests thereof teach for hire. The prophets thereof divine for money. Yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. And that is your latter day uh, TBN doctrine that says no harm will come upon you, only wealth, only health, only prosperity. Only good things. And by the way, if it doesn't, it's your fault because you don't have enough faith and you didn't say positive things. So you don't get those. But we get them because we say everything perfectly and we think all perfect thoughts and on and on and on. And all they're doing is setting you up to send them money and they can say, see, it works. We got all this money. How come you don't have this money? Because it's not working for you. You need to send in more money. So it'll work for you. And it's all about money. What is the love of money? The number one root of all evil. So the bottom line is, if the preacher's not preaching from the word, more than likely he's divining. He's either receiving it from a spirit or he is giving it out of what is in his own depraved heart. But he's not giving the word of God. Let's stand for prayer. I'd keep going with this if I wasn't so tired. Because there's a lot in the Bible about divination. A lot. By the way, if we believe that the Bible is foretelling the future, I want you to think about something. That deal about Samuel. Sam, that Samuel spirit would have never showed up had not Saul asked for him and the witch at Endora. Okay, Endora. Remember what I said about the 60s? Endora. Came right out of the, her name came right out of the King James Bible. Had Saul not asked for him, had Endora not conjured him, the fake Samuel would have never appeared. So that's a prophecy, isn't it? So take that now. The fake Jesus will not come until people ask and the diviners conjure him up. Okay? This Bible's neat, isn't it? Yeah. You, just, you just read tomorrow's newspaper. <laughs> Father, we love you. We thank you for this book. It's good. It's right. It's holy. It's perfect. It is everything, Father. I don't care what the naysayers say. I don't care what the atheists say. I don't care what the non-believers say. I know what I know. I know what I think about this Bible. I know this Bible says it's right. So the Bible's right. Father, thank you, God, for taking each one of us in your own way and opening our eyes to it. Father, we were all blind. We were all ignorant. We were all walking the course of this world on our way to hell when you intervened. So, Father, we thank you for that. Bless your word. 
Bless our church. Bless our families. Thank you, Lord, for those that have come today. Bless them on their journey. Give them safety. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've taught us today. And we praise you in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.